All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. So encouraged you've uh, given your day to to focus on training and to uh, to look into this whole thing of expository preaching. And I've been asked in this session to condense basically three years of material into about 50 minutes. So we're going to see how that goes. But um, I would like to, just as Pastor Sean opened his time in prayer, I would like to do the same and just ask the Spirit to do work among us as we look to His Word. Again, thank you for bringing us together. Father, thank you for these men and their desire to proclaim your Son, to make Him known. Equip us all, Lord, now in this hour. Help us to know your Word so that we may know Him. And know Him, not just information about Him, but know Him. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, guide and direct me and all the material that I have that, uh, Lord, I would speak only what you desire spoken and that I would not misrepresent you in any way and that we would all uh, gain from this session together a greater appreciation for your word and a greater appreciation for your son. And we pray in his name. Amen. All right. Well, you'll see in your notes, um, Pastor Sean was nice to you. He filled all of your notes in. I actually left lots of blank spots. So if you want to take notes, uh, feel free to do that, or if you just want to listen. Uh, the session today, the second session, the first session focused on the, proce on the process, or the, um, the importance, that is, of expository preaching. I want to focus in this session on the process. That is, how do we prepare an expository sermon? I mentioned last night, for those of you who are at the dinner, uh, that I've sat through several sermons in my life, and, and after listening to the sermon and looking at the passage and seeing, not really understanding the text, and then after the sermon was done, very much understanding the text, and thinking about how did the pastor do that? How did he make such a difficult passage easy and clear to understand? Well, that's what I want to help us do in this session together, at least expose you to a process, expose you to a process where you can dig out for yourself what is in the text. Because brothers, what expository preaching should do is to make clear what is unclear. Expository preaching should bring understanding to what is difficult to understand. And I guess I should say it the other way around, to, to not take what is easy to understand and make it difficult. Some preachers do that. Expository preaching should reveal to your hearers what God has said. In the first session, again, we, we looked at the priority of expository preaching. In this session, I want us to look at the process. And that is to, how do we prepare the sermon? Not so, not so that we can ask, how did he do that? But how do we do that? As we look to the sermon together. Um, Let's begin with some foundational principles of expository preaching. Uh, these principles are conveyed in three important words. When you come to studying and preaching the Bible expositorily, you need to understand three things. Hermeneutics, exegesis, and exposition. Hermeneutics, exegesis, and exposition. How are those linked together? Well, good hermeneutics leads you to good exegesis, which will lead you to good exposition. So it's the idea that, uh, and I'll explain these terms in a minute briefly, but, but if you are using the right tools of interpretation, then you will study the text correctly and then proclaim it accurately and clearly. And that's the connection. Hermeneutics comes from a Greek word which means to, to interpret or to translate. And when we use it in relation to the Bible, we, we call hermeneutics the science of interpretation. The science of interpretation. It, it has to do with how we interpret a text. It, it, they are the rules which govern how we interpret the, the text or any communication. And a biblical hermeneutic is based upon two foundational principles. If we were to think of a building, a building is built upon a foundation, right? Well, in having a right hermeneutic, a correct biblical set of hermeneutics, they are built on two foundational principles. Uh, in the first session, session, Pastor Sean mentioned the first one, inerrancy. Inerrancy. Now, there are many definitions of inerrancy out there, some very good ones. I think the, the clearest 
simplest definition of inerrancy was offered by our Lord himself in the high priestly prayer when he simply said this, your word is truth. That's inerrancy. And we must, men, if we're going to be expositors, if we're going to be accurate and clear expositors, if we're going to have exposition that is based on solid exegesis, solid study, that has to be based upon good hermeneutics, and that is based upon recognizing, understanding, believing, having a conviction that God's Word is without error. That it is true. How can you get up in a pulpit and proclaim something with conviction if you're not sure if it's true or not? And so that is the foundational principle of all biblical study, that the Word of God is inerrant. Pastor Sean mentioned 2 Timothy 3.16, that God's Word is inspired, or better understood, expired. It is God-breathed. And because it is God-breathed, that means it is inerrant because God is inerrant. So again, Jesus said, your Word is truth. That is the foundation for all biblical interpretation. And on top of that, a second foundation is this idea of authorial intent. Authorial intent. What does that mean? That is, what did the original author intend for his original audience to understand? That's where we start. We start with what the original author was saying. Inerrancy recognizes there's a divine author. Authorial intent recognizes that that divine author has communicated his truth through human authors. As 2 Peter 1.20 tells us that men were led by the Spirit so that the words that landed upon the page as they were writing were the words intended to be there by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit worked through human authors. Correct? Am I right? Sakto? Can I say that? <laughs> human authors. Therefore, human authors who wrote in human languages, who had human experiences and backgrounds and situations. And so we need to understand what their situation is and was in this case. The principle of authorial intent is simply this, that in any form of communication, it is the author who controls the meaning. We assume that when we talk together, right? As I speak to you, I am meaning to tell you something. As you speak to me, you are meaning to tell me something. I am not the one that determines your meaning if you're speaking. A lot of us who are married, we get in trouble when we do that with our spouse. It is the speaker, the writer, who controls the meaning. And in fact, we see this principle in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11, he said, I wrote to you in my letter, this was in a previous letter, not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world or with covetous or swindlers or with idolaters, for then you have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you to associate, not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous. Notice there I highlighted two statements. As Paul is explaining himself, he tells him, look, this is not what I meant. And then he says, I wrote to you. This tells us that Paul, as the author, intended for them to understand what he was saying. Not for us to say what Paul is saying. And so we see here this principle of authorial intent. There's an interesting text in Matthew chapter 13. You remember, it's usually called Jesus' busy day. Uh, chapter 12 and 13, there's a number of parables that Jesus gives. And at the end of those parables, he turns to his disciples and asks them this question. Do you understand? Simple question, but it reveals a lot. Jesus wanted to make sure they understood what he was saying. It was important to him, and it is important to God that we understand his word. And that comes through understanding what did the original author intend for his audience to understand. We begin there before we try to decide or determine what we need to say to our hearers. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, inerrancy and authorial intent, these are the foundation to a correct biblical hermeneutic as represented by the pillars here in this picture. Uh, a, a, a correct hermeneutic is built upon a correct understanding of authorial intent and of inerrancy, and then that then allows us to have a correct exegesis. Now, what do I mean by exegesis? That simply is a, comes also from a Greek word. It means explanation or interpretation. It's 
It's using sound rules of interpretation, sound hermeneutics, in order to then do the study. You can think of exegesis like an archaeologist. An archaeologist has various tools, and he goes out to a dig, and he uses these tools. He has a shovel and brushes and, and buckets and gloves and other tools that he uses in the process of uncovering a particular artifact or bone or whatever he is looking for. Well, you can think of hermeneutics are like those tools, the tools that he uses in order to do his job. The exegesis is the actual doing of the job, the actual digging, uncovering. And it is like that for us. Hermeneutics are our tools. The exegesis is as we dig into the text to uncover what it reveals. We use those particular tools. And there are many good books written on hermeneutics. We have a hermeneutics expert in our audience today, Dr. Heffen here. He can explain hermeneutics if you ever need to know. But they are a number of different tools. And we won't go through all of those Today, I just want you to understand what they are in terms of a general idea. Okay, so let's talk about the process. The overall process of interpreting the scripture based upon what the author intended to communicate. And I've given this in your notes. You'll see there. there's two boxes. There's, there's exegesis on one side, exposition on the other. Now, the exegesis, I've already mentioned, that is the, the process of applying sound hermeneutics to find out what the original author intended to say in his text. And again, you can see that in the figure. Exposition, then, is the simple and clear communication of that text entirely and exactly as God intended it to be understood, but then communicated clearly to my hearers. Okay? Okay. And so essentially, the job of the expositor is this. He is to use sound exegesis, sound study of the scriptures based upon solid hermeneutics in order to understand what the original author meant for his original audience and then takes those principles and communicates them to his hearers, to your hearers. Man, before we can say what a text means... We have to understand what it meant. As Pastor Sean mentioned, we don't start with application. We don't start with our audience. We don't start with, let's see, what do you guys need to hear? That's what I'm going to tell you. Oh, let me find a verse that fits what I want to say to you. Do you know what that's called? That's called eisegesis, not exegesis. Ex is out of, eis is into. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do eisegesis. We don't want to look at our audience and then determine what to say to them. We want to look to the Word of God. What does God say? What did the God say through the original author? And then from that, what applies to, to my hearers? And the connection point between those, as I note on the figure there, is the timeless truths. Those principles which apply for all generations, to all peoples, all cultures, for all times, in all situations. Those are the timeless truths. And the exegete must identify those truths as he understands what the original author was communicating to his hearers. So we don't want to be eisegesis preachers. We want to be exegesis preachers. Now, in your notes, and I'm not going to go through this, but in your notes there is a, uh, I've given you a, a fuller definition of expository preaching. Pastor Sean read from Haddon Robinson's definition, which is very good. Um, here's one in your notes you can look at and spend time thinking about, but it, it covers what an expository preacher does, who the expository re preacher relies on, and as a result, what the expository preacher is intended to do. Now, in the time remaining... What I'd like to do is uh, go through in a, in a short fashion, maybe a summary fashion of uh, a, an overview of the step-by-step -step process that you can take as an expositor to study the Word of God and draw out these principles for yourself from the Scriptures, what the author is intending to say. And so as we consider an expository sermon, which is based upon good exegesis, which is based upon good hermeneutics, hermeneutics built upon inerrancy and authorial intent. How do we go about doing that? You have a particular passage you're going to preach from. 
how do we begin this process of exegesis so that we can develop a solid expository sermon? What's the first step that you do? What's the first step that you should do when you know, okay, I'm going to be preaching from John chapter 10 this week. Where do I begin? Do you try to find a, a sermon that Pastor Germ has, has done online? That's, is that where you start? Do you look in your John MacArthur uh, study notes to see, is that where you start? Do you um, just pray and hope something pops into your head? We do need to pray, by the way. But we also need to work. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent to show yourself approved. So we need to be dependent on the Spirit, but we also need to be diligent in studying the Word, and that is how the Spirit works. He gives understanding through diligent study, through prayer. So certainly we pray, but first step is to read. Yes, I know that might sound simple. That might seem, a, of course you read. Well, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is reading the book as a whole. Let's say you're in John chapter 10. You don't start in John chapter 10. You have to understand the book as a whole first, correct? Why do I say that? We need to know, and this will be an important word as well that we're going to talk about, the context. You need to understand the context of the passage that you are looking at. And so as we consider the text, the first step that we need to do in order to understand and, and study a passage is, is to read. And I suggest that we read the whole book. Read the book several times. Get thoroughly connected to it. Understand it. You know, more often than not, if we're preaching from a particular passage, we often just get a historical context book or some background book or some introductory book and just start reading what someone else has said. Be honest. Is that what you do? I've done that as well. I mean, you have the pressure of Sunday that's coming on, right? You have to get a message ready because it's not like you can show up in the pulpit and say, you know, I'm just not ready this morning, so we'll just sing a few more songs. Abe, can you come up and let's do a little more singing together? You do that more than a few times and you're going to be uh, asked to do something else. Sunday is coming. And we need to be ready. And so in that pressure, we can tend to run to the resources and, and run to what other people have said to get us a head start. I understand that pressure. At the same time, we need to understand that we need to dig for ourselves. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. And the place where we begin that digging process is to read. And don't just read passively, but read actively. Have notes. Take notes next to you. And if some things come up, oh, I notice he repeats this word a lot or this idea a lot or, or some question comes in your mind. This doesn't make sense. I need to uh, try to understand this later. But interact with, the, path, with, the, with the, the Bible, with the text that you're reading. Don't just read, 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 but not be thinking. So spend a little time reading. Spend some time reading. Believe me, men, if you're preaching through a book, you want to know the entire book before you are preaching through it because, and this has happened to me, I've gotten through a book and then I get to a point and I go, uh-oh. That message I did several weeks ago, I said something wrong because I didn't look ahead. That's not a good place to be. So, read, read, observe. That's the first step. The second step, and again, I'm talking about in regards to the book overall, is I want to understand the context of the whole book. I need to understand two things. First, what is the background context? That is, what is the setting of the book? Who wrote it? To whom did he write it? When did he write it? What, what places are mentioned in the book? Why did he write this book? Historically, where, where is it, this book taking place? What events have prompted the writing of this book? That's the background. That's the background context. Some call it the historical cultural context. But it's basically what is the setting behind the book? A second context you need to understand is called the literary context or the surrounding context. And that is what was actually said. What did the author say? What, what was each of his thoughts that he puts together? That's the literary context. That's the content 
of the book. And so the next step that we do in the process after reading the book several times, getting familiar with it, is study the background context. Study the background context. Because again, every book in the Bible is written by a specific author in a specific situation to a specific group of people because of a, for a specific reason. It's not just that you know, Paul is, is sitting there, he's having some durian one day, and he's just eating and relaxing, and all of a sudden, bing, uh, I need to write a book, and he starts writing. That's not how it happened. For example, Philippians. Why did Paul write Philippians? Because he just missed them, and he thought, you know, I need to write them a letter, just see how they're doing. Well, Epaphroditus had come to Paul, and he'd been given a gift by the Philippians for Paul. Paul was in prison in Rome under house arrest, and he was given a gift by the Philippians who were a giving people. They were give uh, profusely and abundantly, so they gave a gift to Paul, and at the same time, Epaphroditus tells Paul, hey, Paul, Philippian church is doing great. They're advancing the gospel, but there's these two ladies there. Two prominent women, Yodia and Syntyche. Oh, yes, I remember those ladies. Well, they're in a conflict, Paul. They're really at odds with one another. And it's concerning. So Paul writes a letter to the Philippian church. One, to thank them for the gift that they had sent. But secondly, and more importantly, to address this issue of disunity, which would potentially undermine their gospel witness. And if you go back and read the book, you'll see that's what's happening. Yes, Paul mentions joy a lot in Philippians, but the emphasis in that book is not joy. It's on unity so that you will not be a hindrance to the gospel, to the progress of the gospel. And all that's from the book itself. You can dig it out from the text itself. And it begins with understanding the background context. What is going on with who the author is? Who are the recipients? And I put in, in your notes uh, a large chart there. We're not going to go through that. It's just to give you an idea of the kinds of questions you're going to look for when you're looking at the background context. And I, I can't emphasize this step enough because so oftentimes for the background of a book, we just sort of maybe look at a uh, commentary resource, write a couple of notes, and we move on because we want to get to the text. We want to get to the text, right? But you have to understand what is it that prompted that text. For example, someone could say, I'm starving. What do they mean? Would there be a significant difference in what they meant if you found out the person was, uh, was very wealthy versus someone who lived on the streets? Would there be a difference, you think, in what they meant by I'm starving? Or what if it turns out that the person speaking wasn't talking about food at all? But they were saying, I'm starving for affection, for friendship. But we need to understand who is speaking. What is that speaker or writer's situation if we're going to better understand what he or she is saying? Correct? And so the background, studying the background helps us do that. Especially when we're talking about epistles. You know, epistles are what are called situational books. They are written in a particular situation. Something has prompted the writer to write a letter to the recipients. They live in a particular situation, a particular context. And so it is important that we understand that. And so here are some basic questions again in the background context. They're more fully developed in the table that I put in your notes. And you can look there. So that's the background context. And uh, what we do in, uh, in our training program is we uh, help, help the guys in the class to go th walk through that chart and, and dig into the book, first of all. Again, this is looking at the book as a whole. You're still, we're still talking about understanding the book as a whole. Looking at the background of that book. Again, who wrote it? Why did he write it? To whom did he write it? When did he write it? These are important questions that we need to try to answer. Now, not every book has that, all that information. In fact, for example, the Psalms. Many particular Psalms, we don't know the background. We don't know the author. We don't know the situation necessarily. 
But God in his wisdom in those particular instances has deemed that we can still understand what the passage is saying without that information. But that is not the norm. That is just in particular circumstances. Generally speaking, most every book we can find out at least some information about the background that will help us to understand the context of the book. And that leads me to a, the second form of context. The first is the background context. What is the setting of the book? The second type of context we need to understand is the literary context. That is what is written, the writing itself. What did the author say? We can think of background context as what is behind the text and literary context as what is in front of it. What do I see? Now often what happens these days when we talk about interpretation, many preachers take particular verses and they pull them out out of context and come up with some principle that they think is what the passage is expressing. Probably a well-known passage is Matthew 18:20, which says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. That passage is often taught as speaking of prayer. But actually, if you look at what Jesus said right before it, he's talking about church discipline. That when a brother is in sin and you go as an individual or as a church to confront that brother, to bring them back to repentance, Jesus said, when you do that, I'm with you. Where two or three are gathered as you confront a brother or sister in sin, I am there in your midst. Okay? That is what he's talking about in context. Now certainly when we pray, Jesus is there, right? That's not a wrong principle. But we want to make sure we're teaching what the original author was communicating, not what we want him to say or what we think he's saying. And the best way to understand that is first, know the background. Second, understand the author's flow of thought, the literary context. And I have a, it's a rather lengthy quote, but I think this is important. And I put this in your notes because I really think Walt Kaiser uh, has communicated this idea of context very well by using two particular illustrations. Let me just read the quote to you and then we'll talk about it in a minute. The word context, he says, is composed of two Latin words, con, which means together, and textus, which means woven. So when we speak of context, we are talking about the connection of thought that runs through a passage, those links that weave it into one piece. Before we can study the details of a particular First, we must, I think I missed the word passage. First, we must find the author's thread of thought, which runs like a live stream through the smaller and larger parts of every passage. When this connection is missed or avoided, there is a good chance we will miss the scope, end, and purpose, an entire plan by which the author uttered the various parts of his work. There's a lot there, but I want to focus on two word pictures that he gives. The first, he describes context like a thread. A thread that is woven through the text, connecting it together. Kind of like in our clothing, we have a thread that, that's woven all the way through in order to keep it connected together. The surrounding context or literary context is the thread upon which each unit of thought hangs upon. And a second illustration that he gives here is he talks about the context as like the author's thought running like a stream. Now let me ask you a question. Those of you who have been in the preaching program, you have, can't answer this. Now, let's say I'm standing on a bridge over a river, and the water is flowing. How do I know which direction the water is flowing underneath me if I can't see the water through the bridge? Let's say it's a solid bridge, and I look down, all I see is the bridge. Is there any way that I can figure out which way the water is flowing underneath me? Any ideas? What if I look over there? and see which way the water's flowing. And then I look on that side of the bridge and see which way the water's flowing. Will I know which way it's flowing underneath me? Scripture's like that. If I'm in a particular passage, if I see the author's flow of thought before my passage and I see his flow of thought afterwards, guess what? I'll better understand his flow of thought on the text that I'm working on, the, the passage underneath me. And so, Context acts like this flowing river. It moves from one direction to the other. And if a person, like I said, standing on a bridge, he can know the flow of the river by underneath him by looking on each side of him. And that's the idea behind context, where there's 
the author presents one particular thought, followed by another thought, followed by another thought, and by another thought. There's a flow of thought. That's the context. So if I want to identify a particular, let's see, where's my, can you see? Okay. If I want to understand what this second thought is, the better I know the first one and the third one, that will help me to understand the second. Or better yet, like in Matthew 18, 20, I can't pull a thought out. I can't pull a thought number two out of the text without knowing the first or third. Otherwise, I'll misinterpret that thought. Is this making sense? Hopefully, my thoughts are flowing, all right? Now, Pastor Sean mentioned earlier as well uh, a topical sermon. So, an expository sermon, that is one that is based upon solid hermeneutics leading to solid exegesis, which leads to good, solid exposition, is based upon, if we're, say, preaching from John chapter 10, that Jesus in that text is presenting one thought, then a second, then a third, and then there's a conclusion that we draw from the flow of thought, which develops and forms the basis of our sermon. Now, a typical topical sermon that's not expository will have the idea of taking one thought from John and maybe, an, oh, he uses the word shepherd in John. I'm going to go, oh, I know, shepherd is in Psalm 23, and, and oh yeah, in Ezekiel, a chapter, I forget the chapter, 1920, somewhere in there, 24 talks about um, sh uh, shepherding. Oh, in Acts chapter 20, Paul mentions shepherd the flock of God, and in Acts chapter 2, and, and so we grab all of these thoughts which have this word shepherd in it, and we come up with a sermon. We have to be careful. We can't miss out. What is the original author intending to communicate? Do you notice the original author is left out of the topical sermon often? Now again, as was mentioned in the first session, that doesn't mean topical sermons are bad as long as you are communicating each passage within its context. It's okay to use several passages as long as you are understanding the original context in which they're given. So actually a topical sermon is a lot harder. Because then you have to understand not only the context of John 10, but Psalm 23, and Acts chapter 20, and Acts chapter 2. If you're going to have a correct interpretation. And so this I think is very important to understand. And so what we do in the, in the process of, of studying a passage, first we read the book. Second, we look at the background context of the book. Third, we look at the literary context of the book, and what that means is you take each unit of thought and summarize it. Now in an epistle, each unit of thought is represented by a paragraph. A paragraph. That is by definition intended to be a one unit of thought. And there are multiple paragraphs within an epistle. And you can look in your translation, you will see they often identify those paragraphs within the translation. And what you do in this second step of literary context is you summarize each of those paragraphs just in one sentence. Here's an example. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this. This is Philippians. This is my summary of each paragraph in the book of Philippians. So that I've walked through and noticed this isn't an outline. This isn't two or three word summary statement. This is a sentence. It doesn't just state the the topic of the paragraph, but what the author said, in this case, Paul. And so that way, if, say, my passage for this week is Philippians 1, 27 to 30, notice I now have a flow of thought in which I can see what that text, where that verse is located, and what the author has said before, and what he has said after. Now, there's a whole process that we do in the program where I show you how do you summarize a paragraph. That sounds easier than it is. We walk through that. We're not going to do that here together. We don't have the time to do that. But the idea is, through a particular process, understanding what is the author's main point in each paragraph, that gives me the author's flow of thought, and now I can see the flow of the river. And if I were to be preaching from Philippians 1, 27 to 30, I have an idea of what's come before and what's come after. And then I focus my attention on my particular passage. Now, after this, 
after you've read the book thoroughly several times, after you've done the background context, after you've done the literary context, you should be very familiar with the book by now. You're now ready to determine at this point, why did the author write the book? You have to understand that. To rightly interpret any passage, you have to know why did the author write this book? Now, in some books, it's very nice. The author tells us directly. Here's some examples. First uh, Peter 5, Peter says through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying, this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. So Peter here says, I've written to you, testifying of the grace of God so that you would stand firm in it. And we know that the book of Peter, he talks a lot about suffering. So he's telling them, stand firm as you go through these difficulties. And I'm, I'm writing this book to you to give you that confidence to stand firm in the midst of the difficulties you're suffering. Or 1 John chapter 5. John tells us explicitly why he wrote that letter. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. It's a letter of assurance. And so knowing that, as we read the letter, we can then understand John is telling us in 1 John, what are those assurances that can give us confidence to know that we are his? That's really important to understand if you're going to try to interpret any verse from the book. There's several other books where we have the author's stated pur purpose where he says, I have written for this reason. But most books don't have that. Unfortunately, most books don't have the author saying, now, here's why I am writing this letter or this book or this story. Most books, we have to figure that out. We have to be diligent to show ourselves approved. And so, for example, many books, uh, you can figure that out. As you better understand the book, you can determine what the author's purpose was. For example, in Philippians, I already mentioned this, there are two key passages that are mentioned in Philippians that I think reveal what Paul's intent for the book and what he wanted to communicate to his hearers, and that is that they would essentially continue in their progress for the gospel and not allow any hindrance to undermine their testimony, particularly disunity. And so here's a couple of verses that communicate that. But I didn't just pick those out from a commentary or I didn't just try to, you know, um, guess at it or what, what seemed to be right. It was, this was after careful study of the background context, of the literary context, and reading the book and understanding it. What is Paul concerned most about? Why did he write this book, the Philippians? Okay? So, these first three steps that we've looked at, Read and observe, background context, literary context. These deal with the book as a whole. We need to get an understanding of the book overall before we dive into any part of the book. You with me on this? If you, if you take anything away today, take this. <laughs> There's more. I mean, don't fall asleep on me right now. There's more to, to, to see. But I really want you to understand that it's, we so often just focus on a verse or a word. We think expository preaching is word studies. That's what I thought, because I, I sat under Pastor John MacArthur for years. He's an incredible preacher, and he would, uh, as part of his preaching, often tell us what particular words meant. But see, I didn't realize it, but I thought, oh, that's what expository preaching is. You just preach every verse, and then you tell what the Greek word is in each verse. That's not expository preaching. That's part of the exegetical process and understanding what the verse says. But word studies is not expository preaching. Expository preaching has word studies, but word studies are, are not expository preaching. <laughs> Make sense? Some of you are going, oh, okay. <laughs> now, because word studies just deals with one part. It deals with focusing in on just one one small particular aspect of the verse. But what we need to do is start with the big picture. We need the 10,000 meter view. We need to see the forest first. Then we can fly down and look at the trees. So we want to go first at 10,000 meters, then we'll go to the one meter view. Or as one of my seminary professors would say, we start with the bird's eye view and then work down to the worm's eye view. 
until one girl I was teaching in, uh, in my church, uh, teaching Bible study. She's about 12 or 13. She was taking the class. She says, Pastor Tim, worms don't have eyes. I looked it up. She's right, but it still works. Bird's eye, worm's eye, so I'm sticking with it. So now we want to move to the worm's eye view. We want to go from the 10,000 meter level, the book overall, down to the passage itself, the paragraph that I'm focused on. And one of the key steps in that process is what we call the structural diagram. There are different names for this. A block diagram, there's a variant of it called phrasing that you can find in Bible Arc. Uh, there's sentence diagramming, which is a little bit different. But essentially what these diagrams are, are is a visual way to, to see the passage. I think the best way to explain it is to show you an example. Okay, here's a structural diagram for Psalm 117. And basically what a structural diagram does is it takes each phrase or clause and tries to, you try to figure out how that phrase or clause is related to or connected to or modifying another phrase or clause. We have to utilize the tools of grammar uh, and other things as we look at this. But here's a, an example that I gave, a simple example from the shortest book in the Bible. Our shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117. I thought it'd start easy. We'll do Psalm 119 in a minute, okay? But we'll start with one. <laughs> Notice, in this psalm, I have the three main statements. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. Praise the Lord. Those are main statements. They go all the way to the left. They are the primary statement the author is making. And it's really, he's saying one thing, but he's repeating it. That's a poetic expression of for emphasis. So the main sentence here is, praise the Lord, all nations. And then notice verse 2. You see that word for? You with me? Do you see the word for? That word for tells us something, doesn't it? It tells us how the next statement, the next sentence, is connected to the first one. And what is that connection? It's telling us why. Why are, we, why are all nations to praise the Lord? Why are all peoples to laud Him? Because two reasons. His loving kindness is great. His word is eternal. You see a message that forms right out of this simple psalm, the structure here? Basically we have two points. That's our diagram. And from that diagram we can see essentially the outline in this psalm. And you can steal this if you want. The mandate to praise, that's verse 1, the main sentence, two commands, and then the motivation to praise. And that's the other thing. Expository preaching, you always have to have like the same first letter in your points. Did you know that? That's, no, you don't have to. <laughs> but it, it looks cool, right? The process, the practice, the priority of expository preaching. Did you see that in the, in the, uh, the poster? Well, here we have in Psalm 117 the mandate to praise and the motivation to praise. Now, how did I come up with that outline? Well, it's based upon understanding how the text, how the verses in the text are related to each other. And a structural diagram is a process or a step that you take in order to think through and determine what the structure of the passage looks like grammatically. And this is, again, just a simple expression of diagram. When we get to like Paul's epistles, the diagrams become a little more complicated. But we have found, and you can ask the guys that have uh, done this, um, the guys in Taya or others who have done this diagramming or, or arcing, that it really does you help, help you see the text and really think through how are these verses connected to each other? So again, we don't take a verse out of context. We have to understand how each word and phrase is connected to the words and phrases around it if we are to understand the passage correctly. And so a diagram is, I think for epistles, one of the most critical steps in really gaining that understanding of the text. Okay? And so here's just one example again from Psalm 117. Now after you've done this particular structural or, or block diagram or, or phrasing, the next step of that process will be to what we call make textual observations. Textual observations. That is, you, you take that passage that you've diagrammed, and now you step back and think about it. 
Look at the various verbs, for example. The, uh, what kinds of verbs are used? Are they commands? Are they questions? Are they statements? Those are critical. Do you see anything repeated? For example, if we look at our passage from Psalm 117, what's repeated there? Praise, Praise right? And as well, a synonym is used, laud. Praise, law. that's repeated. What else is repeated here? Nations, peoples. Again, what about the verbs? Praise, laud, praise. What kinds of verbs are those? Are those questions? Are they statements? Or are they commands? They're commands. Do you realize, men, we sang that song, Hallelujah, earlier? You know, when you say Hallelujah, that's, of course, Hebrew. It means praise the Lord. It's actually a command. You know, when we say hallelujah, we're actually telling one another, commanding one another to praise God. That's a, that's a freebie. Um, but here we see praise, laud, praise. Those are imperatives. They're commands that are being given. And the verbs in verse 2 are statements. They're declarations. How about the subject? Who is the subject of? of these commands. To whom is the command being given? All nations, all peoples. He's making a statement. Everybody, you praise the Lord. How about in the second verse? Who is the focus there? Who's the subject? It's the Lord, right? The Lord's loving kindness, His truth. Now, so textual observation is just Looking at these different things, does any questions come out from the passage? What does it mean? What does that word everlasting mean? Maybe that's a question that comes up. Or his loving kindness is great. What, loving kindness, what, what does that word mean? And how does it fit here? And, and why does the psalmist here give for the two reasons, God's loving kindness and his eternal word as reasons to praise him? Why are those the two things that he picks? He didn't talk about him being a deliverer. Or he didn't talk about uh, anything else but those two particular truths. Why is that? So that's what you're doing in the step of textual observations. You're looking for uh, things cause and effect. Do we see a cause and effect here? We do in verse 2, right? The effect is praise. The cause is because of his loving kindness and eternal word. Another thing you want to think about, what is the tone of the passage? Is it angry? Is it inquisitive? Questioning? Is it... Here it seems to be a declaration, right? A call to praise, a command. It's emphatic because he's repeating it. So these are kinds of things that you want to note as you're considering the textual observations. Now following that, so we've got the, the first three steps. Look at the book as a whole. Read. Background context. Literary context. And then as we begin to zero in on the passage itself, we do the structural diagram where we look at how each of the phrases and clauses connect together. And then after that, we step back and make observations and think about and look at each of the particular parts of that passage. We're digging, we're digging. Again, think of the archaeologist. Sometimes, yeah, I haven't studied this, I'm no archaeologist, maybe one of you are out there, but I understand sometimes certain digs can take months to uncover particular artifacts because they are delicate, because they are difficult to find, because as they are uncovering that artifact, they don't want to damage it. And it can take a long time. And you can see a guy, he'll be brushing there the whole day. And you're thinking, I could never do that. Oh, that would be painful. How boring. How difficult. How tedious. But you see, if we're going to be good students of the Word, we have to have that same degree of diligence. And sometimes it's a slow process. And you're going, oh, Sunday's coming. I got to get ready. I got to get ready. I understand that pressure. But we also need to take the time to dig, to brush carefully, to understand on our own. And so we do the structural diagram. Amen? Amen? We do the textual observations. Amen? Amen? We read the text over and over. Amen? Amen. 
or fired up. Let's go study the Bible. <laughs> All right, but these are the steps now. So notice we started broad, book as a whole. Now we looked in on the paragraph to do the diagram, the textual observations. Now we go a step further down. Now, now you can do your word studies. Yahoo! All right! <laughs> word studies are a part of the process. A word study is uh, simply looking at the meaning of the word in its original language. Don't look up the definition of the word in the translation. For example, if the word praise in Psalm 117, don't look up the English definition. You want to go back to the Hebrew and understand what did the original Hebrew word mean. And you go, well, wait a minute. I've never taken Hebrew. I don't know any Hebrew. Or if you're in the New Testament, I don't know any Greek. Well, there are some tools out there that can help. There are some tools out there, and we go through those tools within the program as we teach it. But essentially, let me just give you a quick overview. How do we do a word study? And let me tell you this, brothers, right up front. If you've done all the work we've talked about, if you've done the study of the context, the background, the literary context, if you've done the structural diagram, if you've done the textual observation, if you've spent all that time on those first, what is it, five, uh, five steps, honestly... For most words that you encounter, you'll know the meaning of the word based upon the context. You won't have to go into a deep word study most of the time because you'll already understand what the word means based upon the words around it. But it can be helpful to look at particular words in order to uh, see maybe where did that word come from. Sometimes we can get good illustrations as we look at where a word, uh, what it originally meant and, and how it, what it came to mean. And some words are difficult to understand and, and require additional study. But let me just give you this um, um, I guess, short procedure, if you will. There's, a lot, again, a lot of details. But what you want to do first in a word study is identify the keywords. Don't do a word study on every word. The word and. It's used 4,783 times in the New Testament. I mean, you, you can do it if you want, but it, it would take too much time. So what are the key words? Well, the main verbs. So, for example, in Psalm 117, what word are we going to want to do a word study on? Praise. That's a key verb. Or the word laud. It's a synonym. So we want to look for those key verbs, the key actions. We want to look for maybe repeated words. This is a word that the author is using several times. It must be important. That's probably a good word to do a word study on. Or what I often use as a guide is I'll, I have several of the English translations. So I have an ESV, a New American Standard, NIV, um, sometimes a Net Bible. And I'll see, is there any word in my passage that they translate very differently? Sometimes that happens. The translators don't agree. Well, that's a good word then to, to, to do a word study on as well. Or look for words that you just don't make sense to you. I don't know what that word means. I don't understand it. You can do a word study on that. Again, we want to look at the original word. There are tools online. You can go to BibleHub.com or BlueLetterBible.org. BibleHub.com or BlueLetterBible.org and look up on the interlinear selection and it'll give you the actual word. Now, I, unfortunately, I didn't put the example with me today, but... Um, those are some resources, and if uh, in the training program we walk through and show, show you guys how to do that. So first thing is select keywords. Identify those keywords. Then find the lexical definitions, and that's where I would go to BibleHub.com or BlueLittleBible.org and look up the interlinear, and it'll tell you there'll be a, a particular place where it shows you the exact word, and you can look up the Strong's number and get the lexical definitions. That is the dictionary definitions. Now, don't do what a lot of guys do on word studies where they find the lexical definitions. They find there are six definitions for the word praise. Oh, I like the third one. That's the one I'm going to use. That'll preach. Oh, yeah. Be honest. We do that a lot. 
What we need to do is there's a, find the definition that most closely matches the context. And that's hard to do sometimes because you look at some of the definitions and go, oh, that is really, that would really preach. But we have to be careful. We want to communicate what the original author meant. So, select keywords. Find the lexical definitions. Look at other translations, as I mentioned. How is that word translated in the other translations? And by the way, guys, here's another helpful tip. If you have four or five, let's say you're looking at the English translations, and they all translate the word the same, guess what the word means? What the translation has. Because look, multiple Greek scholars have invested their time and effort in doing those translations. And if you're looking at five translations, you're probably talking about 10 or 15 Greek scholars who have looked at that original word, and they all came up with the same translation. Guess what? That's what the translation is 99.9% .9 of the time. All right? So, so that's why it's helpful to look at the different translations. Again, the New American Standard, ESV, New King James, NIV. Uh, King James is a good translation as well, but it uses older English words, and so there may be some difference there a little bit, but it's also a very good translation. And then fourth, and this is important, Look at other passages that use that exact same word. Again, not the English translation, but the original Greek word. And you'll find that when you do a word study on uh, BibleHub.com. It'll show you the other verses where that word appears. And so look in those verses and see, how is the word used there? How is it translated there? That'll give you some direction. And then if you have some additional word study resources, you can consult those commentaries. We'll often have particular words in that verse. It'll have a word study that they've done. Uh, vines is a, a simple, um, give simple definitions. Uh, there's another one, my favorite, it's called New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, but it's a big set and it's not cheap. Um, but I don't know, do you guys have that in your library here by Colin Brown? Do you know? Not sure. Uh, so there are some other resources that you can utilize, but there's some good, good ones online, as I've mentioned. And then finally, and here's the important one, summarize the meaning of the word in its context in your own words. Just give one sentence summary. The word praise means, the word praise in this context, in Psalm 117, means this. That's a summary of all the information that you've been given. So this is a, I think a simple step-by-step -step process in doing a word study, the text. Okay? Again, I wish we could go through specific examples, but we don't have time to do that. I'm just giving you an overview. Remember, we're cramming three years of, of training into, you know, 45 minutes here. So, I'm trying. Okay, I'm trying. All right. So, after doing the keyword study, so we've narrowed all the way down to looking at specific words in the text. What do we do next? Okay, now you can look at other resources. I haven't mentioned them yet. And by resources, I mean this. Commentaries, sermons, Bible handbooks, Bible encyclopedias, uh, journal articles, uh, blogs, uh, those kinds of things that are related to your passage, theology books. Now we have to remember something, brothers. As I mentioned at the beginning, when it comes to these resources, there's so much of a temptation for us to run to the commentaries, to run to the resources at the beginning or near the beginning. Am I right about this? Let's be honest here. None of our congregations here, so we can tell each other the truth. <laughs> right? We go, well, you know, what does this pastor say about this text? Now, let me just see what he says. I'll start there. Well... Listen, outside resources can be, be a tremendous help, and we do need them. But you need to use them wisely. For example, if you're out there digging, and you're an archaeologist, and you go, you know, I think this object is like, it's, it's pretty deep. I'm just going to use this big shovel right away. And you start jamming your shovel in there and digging. Crack. Oh, no. I just wrecked my sample. You know, we need to use the right tool at the right time. 
and resources are very helpful, but we have to remember, and these are Paul's words ring in my ears all the time when he said to Timothy, be diligent, and my name's Timothy, so I take it personally. <laughs> be diligent to show yourself approved, handling accurately the word of truth. And I take that, that dil word diligent, that effort that's required. He's saying, Timothy, you need to take, do the effort. Don't just go to what I've said, you know, my commentary set. I don't know if Paul, Paul's commentaries are our scriptures, so. But the point is this, man. Do the digging on your own first. Then consult the resources. Now, why do I say this? Well, several reasons. Why is it best to do your own study first? Because if you don't, it can breed laziness. It can breed laziness in us as expositors. It can also encourage us not to think for ourselves or wrestle with the text on our own. We need to wrestle. If you want to develop convictions and preach with boldness, with authority, with conviction, then that conviction comes from your own study. Not just from what somebody told you. And it's even so affirming, man, when you do your own study and then you look at these resources and, the, and wow, I actually got it right. That's a great encouragement. But the more you dig on your own and wrestle on your own, the more you own the text. And as a result, if you've done your own study, you will be better equipped to interact with those resources. To know if, if that resource actually is giving you helpful information or correct information. It's like if you were to go and have a discussion with an astrophysicist about the nature of black holes, and he starts talking about, you know, an expanding and contracting universe, and it's based on Einstein's principles of the muon particles, and you're going, what? Huh? You can't... Whatever he says, you're going to go, well, it must be true. He's an astrophysicist, and he studied this stuff, and you would just take it, right? You would assume he's the expert. Well, we can't do that when we get into the pulpit regarding the Scripture. Well, this is what that guy said, and he's studied a lot, so we need to dig on our own so that we can interact with that commentator or with that other preacher and then be helped by it rather than just take everything that he says, which may or may not be correct. If you get, if you, if you bring resources in too early into the process, um, you're going to be biased to that person's particular interpretation. Because, look, guys who've written commentaries, they're not stupid. They're smart guys. Otherwise, a publisher wouldn't have had them write a commentary. So what they say is going to sound good. But that doesn't mean that it's correct. I've got lots of commentaries on my shelves that are not even written by Christians. Because they'll have some good exegetical insight. There, there's a couple of guys that are incredible Hebrew scholars. And so I, I use them because of their knowledge of the Hebrew language. But what their conclusions from the passage are way off. <laughs> So we have to be careful. And how are you going to be careful if you haven't done any study on your own first? Again, that doesn't mean studying it on our own makes us the expert. We have many men who've been gifted and studied and can provide us helpful information. But we have to take that carefully. I mean, you, you know, if you went to a doctor and that doctor said, you have this particular disease and this is the treatment you have to do or you're going to die and it's pretty significant treatment, I would hope you wouldn't just say, oh, okay, whatever you say, doctor. I, I would hope that if it's serious, you might ask another doctor for a second opinion just to make sure it's your life that's at stake, by the way. And so we consult with multiple individuals on important matters and study ourselves. And so that's the case with the scriptures. When you engage in diligent personal study, here's another thing that I've noticed, that the more I study on my own, the more I retain it. And I found many, many times as I'm preaching, some thought will come to my mind from my study that wasn't in my notes. 
just this, I take it as the Spirit of the Lord reminding me of something that I, 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 I had studied and, and brings it into as I'm proclaiming that word. It's happened to me many times. But stuff that I've read from somebody else, I don't remember it that well usually. But again, what I take, studied on my own, I own it. And also too, men, as you study and feed yourself, and Pastor Sean mentioned this in the first session, as you begin to, to feed on the word yourself, it, it impacts you. As a, was that pastor that you were mentioning, Sean, about the, he was just going preaching through Matthew and he was, he was so encouraged just by how the word was impacting him as he studied more deeply. And again, the more you study on your own, the greater will your conviction be in the pulpit. All that said, resources are a very helpful and important tool in the expositor's toolbox. And so I strongly encourage you, get those resources or, or look at them, but make sure you look at good ones. Be careful. There's lots of resources out there. And as I mentioned, there, there are several commentaries that are written by non-Christians. You've got to be aware. Be careful. So whatever resource you're using, you need to ask yourself, is this author a born-again Christian? Does this author believe in inerrancy? <laughs> what is their view of Christ? What is their view of the doctrines of grace? Is the author formally trained? If so, from where? What denomination or theological tradition does the author come from? These are questions you want to answer as you engage. Because if you know, like for example, I have a book uh, on the Psalms by Klaus Westermann. He's a 19th century German, not a believer. Again, one of those guys I was talking about. Now I know that of him. So I'm careful when I read what he's written. I don't have many books and commentaries by non-believers, but there are a few. But be careful. You want good, solid, biblical authors of those resources that you consult. Um, how can I find them? Well, here's some, and I'll, I'll leave this up at the end, so if you want to copy it or take a picture. There's a few uh, trusted resources that are great guides for the kinds of commentaries and resources that you can rely on as trusty, trustworthy. Um, and those are some of the books I mentioned there. And then here are some helpful overall resources that you can get online. I can't vouch for every single thing written on all of these websites, but um, they are, for the most part, very helpful resources. And I, th oh, I can't, my, we were talking about Martin Lloyd-Jones earlier. I had that up here. I don't know what happened to it. The Martin Lloyd-Jones, oh, there it is, mljtrust.org. So there's, these are resources that are commentaries, that are biblical word studies, that are uh, sermons. I highly recommend that you utilize some sermons to see how particular uh, expository preachers have treated a, a certain passage. Sometimes they can give you helpful ideas for illustrations and things like that. Again, I'll put this up afterwards, so if you want to take a picture of these resources. But I want to get to the last and most critical part of the exegetical process. This is where the whole process is aiming. And notice I've sort of giving you a picture, it's like a funnel. We're going from broad, the background context, literary context, and then we're narrowing ourselves down. And what is it that we're after ultimately? What is it that the study process, the exegetical process is intended to produce? What is the goal? What did the author mean? Original author, right? And we can represent that with what we call the author's what, why, and how. Essentially, it's the author's main point and outline. The what, why, and how. And what do we mean by that? What you want to do is from your exegetical study, everything you've looked at, the diagramming, the textual observations, the word studies, the literary context, background context, all of that information, the resources, the various commentaries you've looked at, you want all of that to basically help you identify the author's main point in that paragraph. And you can represent that main point with these three questions. What? The what is the subject of the text, the author's point. What did he say? And then secondly, the why. 
That is the context of the text. We not only need to understand what the author said, but why did he say it? Why is it there? Very important question. You need to know both of these before you're ready to preach the text. You have to know not only what he said, the topic, and what he said about the topic, but also why did he say it? And this is where the author's flow of thought can be helpful. And then thirdly, how? How did the author explain it? That is the outline of his passage. So let me give you an example. I think most of us are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13. What's that chapter about, men? 1 Corinthians 13. Love, right? That's the topic. But that's not the author's main point. Love is the focus, but what did he say about love? And why did he say it there? Do you know why? Why is 1 Corinthians there? He's talking about spiritual gifts, and then he talks about tongues, but right in the middle, he talks about love. How does that fit? How does it fit within the book as a whole? Do you know why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians? And why did he, he begin in chapter 1 and then to chapter 2, etc.? And then, like I said, chapter 13 is when he brings up this point about love. So as we think about 1 Corinthians 13, the what is the qualities of biblical love or the characteristics of, and then the why, do you know why he addressed it there? Because the letter to the Corinthians, he talked a lot about disunity. Again, like Philippians. Because remember how did the letter begin? They're arguing about, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I was baptized by Peter, etc., all these conflicts in the church. And you get to chapter 12, and there, there's disunity around spiritual gifts. They were abusing the spiritual gifts they had been given. Paul says they've been given for the common good. But they were abusing that. And so chapter 13, he says, look, 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 look. <laughs> this is what's more important than anything in regards to being unified. And that is love. So he talks about what? Qualities of biblical love. Why? To address disunity and the abuse of the gifts, and then how, and that would be his outline. Unity promoting biblical love is superior to, and then he mentions those three particulars. That is the author's what, why, how. If you get to this place, your sermon's just around the corner, man. But here is representing, this is what the author meant, and that's what I need to dig for first. Before you are a preacher, you are an exegete. <laughs> Before you proclaim the word, you must study the word and apply it in your own life. You remember Ezra, Ezra 7.10? Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord. And remember, Ezra was a genius. <laughs> he was a Hebrew expert, and he studied. He studied the law of the Lord, practiced, and then taught it. So, this is what we're after. The author's what, why, how. Because once we get that, now we can identify the timeless truths from the author's main point, and that is what we then preach to our hearers. So knowing 1 Corinthians 13 directly applies to a case where there's disunity, I can now apply it to my hearers if there's any sort of disunity or conflict going on. I can direct them to what Paul directed the Corinthians to. Look, this is the superior way. All right. Well, we only covered half. So in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to do the rest of the process. No. If you want to get more details on the exegetical process, if you want to get understanding of um, the expositional process, and there I've listed several steps that, that we teach regarding the, the how, do you, how do you prepare the sermon. You know, once you get the author's main point, you're, you, you're only halfway there. Oh, 15-minute extension. Oh, I'm going to end it pretty quick anyway. How do you say, uh, uh, I think this is Tagalog, Mukong, Mukong Sleepy Kayo? Is that right? Um, so I'll just take a couple more minutes. Because um, I was ignoring. Was there like a, a light up here too I'm supposed to be looking at for the time? This is the whole process. So we've covered that first, the top part of the hourglass. The exegesis, the study. 
How do we get to the author's main point? But you're not, that's not your sermon. Don't just get up there and spit out your exegetical information. What you need to do then is communicate it to your hearers so that they understand. And we need to do that in such a way that we're engaging, that we're effective. Expository preaching should not be boring. If an expository preacher is a boring preacher, then that's what he is, a boring preacher. At least he's accurate. And that's critical. But you don't have to be an accurate preacher and also a boring one. You can be accurate and clear and also effective. Amen? That's what we're after. And so the, there is a process in putting together the sermon once you've gotten the author's main point. You understand the timeless truths. Um, and there's these other steps that I mentioned. And then finally, you have a, a manuscript that you've put together to prepare you for actually preaching the text. And you don't have to bring that manuscript into the pulpit. Some, some guys don't even bring anything into the pulpit with them. Um, that's, again, a whole other discussion, what pulpit notes. But basically, here's the principle I would encourage you men with. Whatever you bring into the pulpit, don't let it be a distraction to what you communicate. If you bring a manuscript in the pulpit and you do this for the whole sermon, so praise the Lord. That's the first verse in our sermon. And notice the second verse, laud. Laud the Lord, all nations. That's going to be a distraction. So, or if you don't have any notes and you're, um, praise the Lord. That was the first point. Um, praise means, you know, maybe you need a few notes to help you guide you. What we don't want to be is a distraction or a hindrance to the word of God being proclaimed. And you need to bring into the pulpit with you whatever it is that will help you communicate the passage without being a hindrance in the way you communicate. Does that make sense? So some of you, you a full manuscript will be, will be fine as long as you're not reading it, but just using it as a guide. Some of you, just an outline. And there are some, like Pastor Vincent, he has no notes. He just comes up with his Bible and he's able to remember and retain things. So... This is the overall process from the text to the pew, from the scripture to the exposition of it. And so, men, I, my encouragement to you is I hope at least some of this has stirred your thinking, maybe challenged you a little bit to consider doing some things maybe you haven't done before as you study the scriptures. But the goal of this session was just to help you, give you some tools to determine the meaning of the passage on your own, to dig for yourself before relying on others. And guys, may God bless you as you seek to handle accurately his word of truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me close our time in prayer. Oh Lord, so much here, so much involved in being good students of your word so that we may be good proclaimers of it. And we understand, Lord, that, that proclaiming your truth requires effort on our parts to understand that truth. And so, God, I pray that by your spirit you would empower each of us as we seek to be diligent students of your word that you would give us understanding. Give these men great understanding as they dig. Lord, direct us to helpful resources that give us an accurate picture of your word, but, but only after we have spent time on our own in the text and with you seeking to know what you have said uh, through those, these authors of scripture. Lord, I pray that uh, through that effort, then God, as your word is faithfully and accurately and clearly proclaimed with conviction that, that Lord, then your sheep will be blessed. And your people would become more like Christ. And Lord, that is why we are here, is to, to equip the flock so that they would be ministers to one another to the end that they would mature and be like Christ. And that's what we want, because that's what we know will honor you most if we all look like your son. And we pray in his name. Amen.